Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Our Lord Jesus Christ said the first commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord, have mercy. And so let's join in the following confession. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy and walk humbly with you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. First reading is taken from Luke chapter 22, beginning to read at verse 14. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfilment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Our second reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning to read at verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This is the word of the Lord. Today we're looking at the Bible's teaching on communion and how that has been interpreted by the Church of England in order to see whether our current practice falls in line or whether we need to change anything. At the Last Supper, Jesus commanded his disciples to eat bread and drink wine. The New Testament accounts of the Last Supper give limited information about the practical arrangements of this eating and drinking, and details remain obscure. How did it relate to the Passover meal? How many times did Jesus pray? How many cups were involved? Luke's account, for example, seems to mention another cup given to the disciples before the bread. So in Luke 22, verse 17, Jesus says, after taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, you won't drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Jesus then shares the bread and then after supper takes a cup. Is it the same cup or a different one? This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. That may seem concerning until we recognise that communion or the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist, which simply means Thanksgiving or whatever you want to call it, is an act of remembrance. It's not a reenactment. We don't uh, dress up as first century Jews and try to historically reenact the events of Maundy Thursday. The important thing to recognise is that in the Christian church, the Lord's Supper is not meant to be an exact replica, rather Holy Communion is an act of remembrance, remembering not the uh, events of the Last Supper itself, but the death of Jesus on the cross, his broken body and his blood poured out for you and me. Do this in remembrance of me. That is the command of Jesus. Now, the key question for the church is how to obey Jesus' direct command. Do this in remembrance of me. It appears once in Luke's version, twice in Paul's version, as well as uh, occurring in uh, Matthew and Mark. Jesus' uh, institution of the sacrament uh, gives churches wide liberty to decide almost all the practicalities for themselves. There are no rules about how the bread should be baked, or the alcohol content of the wine, or the method of distribution. Only the broad outline is laid down. The New Testament accounts all speak of uh, a prayer of blessing or thanksgiving, uh, the visual symbolism of bread broken and wine poured out is repeatedly emphasised, but looming largest of all is the act of eating and drinking. Now, for the first thousand years of church history, this pattern was followed. The whole congregation received Holy Communion in both kinds, that is, bread and wine. During the Middle Ages, though, it became increasingly common in the Western church for the laity, that is, the congregation, to be offered bread only perhaps uh, initially because of concerns over infection from a communal cup at a period where plague was common, or maybe because of fears over spilling the blood of Christ, uh, this practice became a subject of intense doctrinal debate. Uh, John Calvin, for example, asserted that the medieval church had snatched or robbed a half of the supper from the greater part of the, the people of God. The reformers argued that it is harmful for only the clergy to receive bread and wine for two main reasons. Firstly, it ignores the explicit command of Jesus that when the Christian family is gathered, all are to eat and drink in remembrance of him, not just the privileged few. Secondly, it undermines the priesthood of all believers, i.e. that we're all the same, and by granting to the clergy special uh, privileges which are denied to the laity, you're kind of uh, making a hierarchy that which simply isn't there in scripture. Holy Communion is a gift for the whole people of God. None are to be excluded from full participation. Uh, in England, uh, this uh, was made the law of the land by the Sacrament Act of 1547, the first piece of legislation under Edward VI. Even today, it is an unrepealed law that both bread and wine are offered in the Church of England. There is one important exception to that, which I'll come back to. This legislation took liturgical shape in the Book of Common Prayer, first published in 1549 and then revised in 1552. It especially emphasises obedience to the commands of Jesus in Scripture. 
we're reminded in the liturgy that Jesus did institute and in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death. And the following words were said, Hear, O merciful Father, we most humbly beseech thee and grant that we receiving these thy creatures of bread and wine, according to thy Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. The congregation eating and drinking at Holy Communion, according to the prayer book, is an act of, of obedience to Jesus Christ. Common worship, which is the modern liturgy we use, pick up, picks up the same idea with the phrase, as we follow his example and obey his command. Now, the same point is also made in the 39 articles that at my ordination I had to agree to. Article 30 states, the cup of the Lord is not to be denied to the lay people, for both the parts of the Lord's sacrament by Christ's ordinance and commandment ought to be administered. And for many centuries, this has been a core aspect of Anglican sacramental teaching. But, as I mentioned before, the Sacraments Act of 1547 did build in one important exception or caveat. Both bread and wine are to be administered, except necessity otherwise require. What necessity did the framers of the legislation have in mind? Perhaps it was intended to cover practical problems, such as when the wine ran out or the grape harvest failed, or perhaps it concerned the spread of infectious diseases, a series of plagues swept England during the early decades of the 16th century, including in the 1540s, shortly before this legislation was drafted. And the Sacraments Act allows for the temporary provision of communion in one kind only, bread, in extreme situations. Now that is why, as Covid restrictions began to lift, we at first went down the road of offering bread or wafers only. So you may remember that at first, when we came back to using this building, we didn't have any communion services at all. And then for a period of time, we just gave out wafers and only I drank the wine. And that seemed to conform with this caveat, except necessity otherwise required. However, as time went out on, I and a number of clergy in the Church of England felt very uneasy about this. It seemed to go directly against those two points made at the time of the Reformation, that Jesus commanded us to eat and drink in remembrance, and also that we are a priesthood of all believers. That is, we're all equally part of the body of Christ. But how do you administer wine safely? Well, the answer we adopted here was to use individual cups and that's what we've done since Christmas Day of last year. Now different Anglican churches have done different things. Some have just temporarily stopped all communion services until it's deemed safe to return to using the chalice common cup as it's sometimes called. Now that's what we did at first and that's what many churches did at first but gradually more and more churches have adopted some form of communion service. Some have used the communion liturgy, but not actually had the bread and wine. And this is sometimes called a spiritual communion. The original Book of Common Prayer recognised that a communicant could take part spiritually without actually receiving the bread and the wine. Now, people, of course, do this in our own service when they receive a blessing. But it was never intended that the whole congregation did that. Many churches still do what we did for a short while, and that is to offer wafers only whilst the minister has the bread and the wine. As I said earlier, this doesn't really treat us all equally, nor does it strictly follow Jesus' command to eat and drink in remembrance. That's not to say that a person can't individually decide just to take the bread or wine, but both should at least be offered. Some churches have adopted intinction, where a, a wafer is dipped into the wine uh, before it's eaten, either by the person taking communion or by the uh, person giving out the communion. Or another version of that is infusion, where a drop of wine is placed on a wafer. Now, I've got several issues with that. Firstly, it's a bit messy. Secondly, it's a bit unhygienic as well, and depending on how it's done, it could contaminate the wine. If you're a celiac or something like that, you don't really want uh, wafers dipped in wine. And then thirdly, it moves away too much 
from this symbolism of drinking, not really drinking, to sort of dip something in wine. Some churches have uh, a return to using the chalice, but others like ourselves have temporarily started using individual cups. Now, for me, the use of individual cups certainly satisfies the biblical requirements of allowing people to have both bread and wine. But some in the Church of England have reacted against that. One argument against it has been that in not using a chalice, we're moving away from the symbolism of a common or shared cup. Now, for me, that's a bit of a weak argument. For a start, larger churches and certainly cathedrals use several chalices, not one. Secondly, we already have individual wafers, so why not individual cups? After all, Paul says, we who are many are one body, for we all share one loaf. So if the Church of England wants to be literal in its interpretation of one cup, then it should rule out the use of wafers as well. But wafers came back into fashion in the early 20th century and were legalised finally in canon law several decades later. The other argument against individual cups comes from a, the more Catholic wing of the church or, or those who see wine as uh, literally being Christ's blood and don't like the idea of wine being left over, however minuscule, in these individual cups. Now, at first, the bishops in the Church of England were very resistant to churches using individual cups. But as the pandemic carried on and as people complained about not being able to take wine, they relented slightly. And rather than changing canon law and formally recognising or allowing the use of individual cups, they've allowed a period of experimentation where churches have licence to adopt any or a mixture of practices on a temporary basis, uh, as I've outlined, with a view to returning to the use of the chalice when it's safe to do so. Now, that period of experimentation began last year. And uh, so at Christmas, we introduced individual cups for the reasons I mentioned, but it's always with a view to returning to the chalice because we're only allowed to use these individual cups on the understanding that it is a temporary situation. So that's where we are now. Although the Bible does not necessarily prohibit the use of individual cups, the laws of the Church of England at present only allow it as a temporary measure. And indeed, they don't allow it formally. It's just allowed under this umbrella word of experimentation. In the future, it might become permanently legal. But remember, it took decades for the church to formally allow wafers. So it's not going to happen overnight. Now, given this situation, what we need to do is to begin a process of returning to the use of the chalice. Now, the first thing that I want to say is there is no immediate rush. We are dealing still with COVID. And although infection rates and the severity of the virus uh, because of the jab seems to have dropped, we have uh, no way of knowing, do we, at this present time, if there'll be another spike, possibly in winter. Some churches have not yet returned to communion, or will be a minority of them, and some have only just started. Now, at May's PCC meeting, we uh, discussed a possible timetable and agreed to continue doing what we are doing through summer. Then in September, we're looking to gradually reintroduce the use of the chalice. And the way we plan to do this is that the first Sunday of the month, we'll use the chalice. And then the third Sunday of the month, in other words, a second communion service of the month, we'll use the individual cups. So we're not going to change too many things at once. We'll still administer communion in the same way. In other words, people will still be asked to remain seated and we will bring around either the chalice on the first Sunday or the individual cups on the third Sunday. And we'll do this from September until the end of the year. Uh, if people wish to have a wafer but not to drink from a common cup, that's absolutely fine. Depending on COVID levels and on what the Church of England may or may not have decided, we'll then look to phase out the use of individual cups in the new year. But personally, so long as it's safe to do so, I have no particular preference for the chalice or for individual cups. It is much more important that we recognise the biblical significance of communion in terms of remembering what Jesus did for us on the cross. Participating together then as his body, the church and proclaiming his death until he returns. That's what we do in communion. It's remembrance 
and participation. However, as part of a denomination, we are required, as far as conscience allows, to remain within the rules of that church, that governing body. And I and we as a church are not free just to do as what we like. There is an expectation to return to the chalice, so we need to find a way to do that. And that's why we've set this roadmap as a PCC. It's not set in stone because we need to respond to events as they happen. But the plan is to continue uh, doing what we are doing until the end of summer, then from September to December to kind of alternate in the month, first chalice, and then on the third Sunday, individual cups, uh, while still seated. Uh, and then from next year to phase out the use of the individual cups to move back to the chalice. Now, I want to underline that if anyone has any concerns, please do have a word with me. We want to move forward sensitively, taking everyone with us. Communion, by definition, is communal. It's something we do together. So it's important that we move forward together. So let's pray. Jesus said, eat and drink in remembrance of me. And Lord, we thank you for the institution of communion. And we thank you for this privilege we have in remembering your great sacrifice for us. And Lord, we pray that we might do this in unity together, communally. And so, Lord, we pray for this way forward, that it might be the right way forward for us as a church family. We pray, for, too, for other churches as they, as they deliberate, make decisions over what the best course of action is for them. And, Lord, we ask that as we eat and drink in remembrance of you, as we remember your sacrifice, so we might participate as your body here on earth to your praise and glory. Amen. Yeah. 
we just have a time of silence as we bring our own prayers to God now? We ask all of these things in the name and for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. So we join in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>
may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, and the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen.